The most important decision you are going to make as a Christian is which church you choose to be a part of. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but if you think about all the implications of what a church should be in your life, it is more important than your neighborhood. It is more important than your job. It is more important than the school district. Finding and getting deeply involved in a local church is critical for you and for multiple generations. That's what we're talking about today on Redeeming Truth. So how do you spot a good church? There's no such thing as a perfect church. Everybody knows that. But the question is, are there churches that are seeking to be faithful to the scriptures? And that's the idea. When it comes to something like this, before we jump into how to spot a good church, I just need to say, starting off, first of all, that you need to have a church. You need a local church, that it is something that is critical to your spiritual life. And I know there are some extreme cases out there where people can't be in person, but I'm not talking to the extremes. If that that's you, so grateful you can find church online to be a blessing. But for the vast majority of people, at least in America, you can find a solid local church to, uh, to be a part of. And when you find one, second, go consistently. Go every single week. Go all the time. It is not okay. The, the, the statistics out there say that a faithful, committed Christian goes to church at least twice a month. No, that's ridiculous. You go every time the doors are open if you're able, because there is so much good that God can and mm -hmm. will do, not just in your life, but through your life at a local church. And so make sure that you find a good one, you go to it, and you go to it consistently. Now, guys, there are a lot of preferences that come into the question of how do I spot a good church? And what people do is they elevate their preferences mm -hmm. to the level of principle. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to this discussion, we're not talking about things like casual versus formal, traditional or tempor contemporary, small church versus big church, uh, reverent worship versus lively worship, organ versus guitar, um, evening service, no evening service, Wednesday night service, mm -hmm. no Wednesday night service, mm -hmm. Uh, good kids ministry, not good kids ministry, great music, not great music. Like all of that is preference. Mm. All of those, I mean, that may be something that is, is that, that comes into play when it comes to how to find a good church, but it's not the level of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So mm. we're going to answer eight questions on how to spot a good church. And the first question is this one, is the biblical gospel preached? So guys, Help us, help us out here. What is the biblical gospel? I think in its essence, of course, it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is not any type of works blending into that is a key concept to the true gospel. Yeah. Uh, and I, of course, with that then, as you believe in Christ, you repent of your sins and move away from sin and move toward Christ as your only hope for salvation. I think that would be a short version of it. Yeah, I mean, you have a, a doctrine of God. God is holy, God is just, God punishes sinners. We've, we're sinners, we've broken God's law. And uh, Christ has been um, punished for our sin in our place as our substitute in order to receive the benefits of his death on the cross and his resurrection. We must trust in him, turning from our sins, trusting mm -hmm. in him. And so when, when the biblical gospel is preached, those are some of the components you will hear, right? And mm. so there, there are other ways that people try to preach the gospel. And so my, my point in this one is to say, let's, let's be clear. And when, when a, when a pastor at church is calling on people to respond to Jesus in some way, there are some components that need to be there. So, so again, what are some of those components? Well, if we go to uh, Paul's exhortation to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, um, you know, he's laying out for Timothy the, the, the methods and, and purposes for him being a pastor in a local church. And in verse 14, he says, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. That's a good foundation. We're here to gather together unified in truth, right? Not to argue about, uh, you know, various preferences. And then he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And and so the this, this call, this charge to a pastor to uh, not, 
go into the study looking for a message to preach, but to go into the scriptures to pull out God's message to share with his people. So we're, we're going to get to that one in mm-hmm. a second, because we're because the second question is going to be, are the messages biblical? Yeah. And so for this one, what, what you'll hear out there is things like, hey, you know, your life isn't really going the way that you want it to go. Just give Jesus a chance. Just mm-hmm. come to Jesus and um, he'll he'll make your life better. He'll mm-hmm. fix your marriage. Your kids will your kids will get straightened out. Maybe you'll get off drugs. You'll have more sales. Um, so come to Jesus or say yes to Jesus. So there are things that are missing in that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what, what what would those things be? It's often been said that before you can understand the good news, which is the gospel, you have to understand the bad news, right? Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes preaching or sometimes TED Talks is what Mm -hmm. people get today, lack and a proper understanding, as you said earlier, of the holiness of God, um, our, our standing before God mm-hmm. because of our sinfulness. Mm-hmm. And so it has to include who God is, who we are in light of His mm-hmm. holiness, which is sinners, who are worthy of condemnation, and then the good news comes into play. What has God done for us? He sent His Son to die that we might have everlasting life. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things I would say is 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 we need to be careful of churches that make you the center of attention, mm-hmm. or you the center or the focus of the service, mm-hmm. rather than making Christ the focus Amen. of the service. Yeah, so we've got, is the gospel biblical? The second question I think people should ask when trying to spot a good church is, are the messages biblical? And so the way that the way I've tried to summarize that is that um, the Bible uses the preacher to preach its message mm-hmm. rather than the preacher using the Bible to preach his message. And the reason why we would do that is because we believe in the inspiration of Scripture. The Scripture comes from God, which means the, the point of the message should be the point of the passage. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot of churches that try to avoid some of the harder concepts of scripture. Mm-hmm. So, you want a church that actually preaches the full counsel of God's word, mm-hmm. not just pick and choose the easy parts. Um, that's an aspect of of preaching expositorily. To use a fancier word for that, which is what you just said, where the the main message of the sermon is the message of that passage that you're going through, not handpicking passages or going through books and just cherry picking, uh, like I said, the easy stuff, but rather they're preaching the full counsel of God's word over the course of time. Maybe not every Sunday, you mm-hmm. can't get everything in, but sure. over the course of time, you see that there is a regular and faithful preaching Old and New Testament hard doctrines all the all the promises all the good stuff and and all the stuff including what kevin just said too that you got to understand the bad news and that and that's all in there so you yeah. don't want to leave anything out when it comes to that kind of a church yeah you're not gonna come to the bible as an editor mm-hmm. right and say mm-hmm. this is the this is the part that that i want to talk about and this part i don't or this is the part that my my people will really benefit from and this is the part that they won't but that you're you recognize that you're not the head of the church mm-hmm. christ is the head of the church he mediates that authority through his word and then through those who preach his word and so when when the word is preached um Christ is the head of the church. Mm -hmm. His word becomes what dictates everything going on. And then when the word is preached, God is active. He is, he is, you want a God, a a church where God is active. There's going to be a connection between God's activity in a local church and the preaching of the word. Mm -hmm. And so you, you want a church where the messages are biblical. Mm -hmm. Um, third, uh, you're going to want to, the the way you spot a good church, you're going to want a church where there are qualified leaders. So what is a qualified leader? local church yeah i mean you go to the pastoral epistles there are a couple different uh, lists there about what it means to be a qualified overseer Mm -hmm. in in the bible so you want basically summarizing it you want men who are who have good character they know the word they know how to defend the word they know how to defend Mm -hmm. doctrine Mm -hmm. um they live their lives in such a manner that um there's no secrecy they live above Mm -hmm. above reproach Mm -hmm. um they're hospitable i mean men who are living out their faith and um to do that um you do that in where in community so men who are also a part of Mm -hmm. of the community of the church um making themselves available for the flock to see and to have a relationship with Mm -hmm. so you don't want people hiding Mm -hmm. is is the bottom line of that you want to be able to know that your leaders 
um, are qualified, as the scripture says, and somebody's going to pull that up, I'm sure, um, as the scripture calls them to be. But the the way you figure that out is that you watch them do it. This is not something. So that's something you do in secret. So pastors who are not part of the of the church life, pastors who are not in community or in relationship with people mm-hmm. in the church, um, that to me would be a warning sign. Yeah. Anything else? Qualifications? Anything you guys would add? Yeah. I mean, in quite often in in uh, selecting church leadership, you see local churches pick guys who are influential, who have maybe had business success or have uh, brought a lot of sway uh, relationally or emotionally to the church. And, uh, you know, they end up becoming, you know, those A-type leaders that can just kind of take the reins and run rather than exactly what Dale was saying, First Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the lists given to us are mainly character qualifications of being above reproach, husband of one wife, being temperate, being prudent, having your life under control and under the authority of Scripture and mm-hmm. Christ first and foremost. Then it adds in, you know, able to teach. Then we see other, uh, you know, passages about being able to refute false doctrine, reprove, rebuke, and or rebuke and exhort uh, with with patience, with all authority, and letting no one disregard you. Um, these are the qualifications God has given for leaders of His church. So when churches select leaders in a different way, I think that's a, mm-hmm. a big red flag to yeah. run. Yeah, really, and that mm. list isn't just really for pastors. Yeah, it's meant for all men mm-hmm. in the church, and so you want pastors who model that, so you can say, "Be like him" mm-hmm. or "Follow his his uh, example," just like Paul would say, "Follow me as I follow Christ." Yeah. Couldn't be perfection, can't be perfection, mm-hmm. but the pattern of their life is such that you would say, "Be like that person." Yeah. And so that's a key aspect of that. In Second Samuel twenty three three through four, there's a couple of verses that I think uh, help to highlight what biblical leadership uh, results in. And it says there, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass sprout from the earth. So there's life, there's flourishing mm-hmm. that takes place. Mm-hmm. In this case, the, the body of Christ, the church. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Kind of to put it simply, the sheep need shepherds, those mm-hmm. servant leaders who are going to love the sheep, uh, who are going to, to feed the sheep, who are going to protect the sheep, mm-hmm. um, not to rule over them, but but to serve them as leaders mm-hmm. are called to do. Yeah, I think about Romans chapter 6 a lot in this context, just in the sense that we are, we are called to be servants. Right, we're not yeah. we're not to be served. We are to serve the mm-hmm. first and foremost Jesus Christ, but also His church. Right, and so being in a position of leadership in the local church means that you're willing to be a slave. And being a slave means you don't have rights. It's not about you. It's not you're. It's not about you being elevated into a position or a role and being honored is actually the opposite of that, that you're going to actually, like Jesus showed us, you're willing to kneel down and wash feet. You're willing to be um, even mocked and ridiculed, and you're willing to do things that I think our culture really rebuffs, even in the church. Um, but when you look at what it means to lead in the context of the church, it means that you're willing to serve people beyond even what I think our initial definition of the word serve means. Sure. You're willing to go all the way to lay your own life down for the good mm-hmm. of those who are in, in the church. Mm. Yeah, First Peter chapter 5 kind of summarizes what all of you guys have been saying when he tells the elders of the church he was writing to, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Yeah. And so having leaders who can, who you can look at, and you can look at these texts that we've mentioned, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, Titus 1, 6 to 9, First, it was First Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, and be able to say, yes, I can see these passages in the lives of the men that are at this church. It's a critical way to spot a good church. Fourth, how do you spot a good church? That the tone being set by the culture in that church is one of humility, happiness, and love. Can you guys speak to that? Well, I think I think it, what we were just talking about it starts from from the leadership, right? So the mm-hmm. leadership will set the tone of what the church will look like um, across the board, right? So mm-hmm. if the if the leaders are 
um, living humble lives and they're showing humility in how they deal with things and deal with people, then I think you're going to see that throughout the church as well. So mm-hmm. I, I think it starts with pastors in the church. So if you're mm-hmm. looking at a church where, you, where it lacks humility, where, where men are being honored more than Christ is being honored, that would be a warning sign for mm-hmm. me. Yeah, and then that falls and flows out of the true gospel. If the true gospel mm-hmm. is being preached there, it's going to transform lives, and those lives are going to be like Christ. And so they're following sure. Christian leadership, setting the tone. They're loving their neighbor. They're loving the Lord. They're sacrificing. They're giving to those in need. Uh, just like Acts chapter 2, right at the very get-go, the early mm-hmm. church was there um, caring for the needs of the people in the church. And you, you'll see that flow out of that relationship. Um, with the word, with the gospel, transforming mm-hmm. them. Yeah, First Timothy one five, Paul says the goal of our instruction is love That's right. from a pure heart. It's not just his love for the people, but that would be the re- the goal of their instruction. The mm-hmm. end of that instruction mm-hmm. would be yeah. that the people would be loving, they would be holy, that there would be a sense that there there is a transformative effect of God's word through qualified leaders in the midst of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Being called the family of God, I think, yeah. is, is yeah. a key component to that. Yeah, how often do you see a household where you have super lax, you know, comfortable parents, and then you have really uptight, snobbish kids, right? That typically doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Right. You, the, the parents are setting the tone for the household. And quite often, you know, if the parents are running amok and, and there's chaos in the house, the kids' lives are kind of the same. And when parents have their lives in order and they're disciplined, typically that, mm-hmm. that bleeds down to the kids. So starting with leadership, and then, um, you know, kind of from that mm-hmm. same mentality that you were talking about, love from a pure heart, you know, Paul talks about that in, in um, um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, am, I, am I talking about the right passage, right? Love is patient, love yeah. is kind, yeah. right? Yeah. Sorry, my brain just went off for a second. You know, the idea of whatever gifting you have in the practice of the body, if it's done for your own selfish gain and if it's not done for love, and really that self-sacrificing for the good of somebody else love, then it's kind of purposeless. It's just noise. And so, you know, the the goal of of the the leadership setting the tone for that is not only to uh to, to set the trajectory for where the church should be headed, but we do so knowing that the natural flesh mm-hmm. built into people is that's not our natural reaction. Mm-hmm. We need to train that into ourselves and make that what our chief characteristic is, because that just doesn't come yeah. naturally. You use the word happy happy in there too, happiness. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, as I think through that word and what that means in the context of the church, I think about contentment. Regardless of the circumstances going on inside the body, around us in the world, you have a church that's content. And in what what that will show inside of a, a body life is a lack of um, disunity. There's not any kind of factions going on. Mm-hmm. If there are factions, they're met with quickly by the mm-hmm. leadership to make sure that um, they're snuffed out, for lack of a better word. So you, you can feel inside of a church, if you're visiting a church, if you're there for long enough, you can feel, is this a factious church? Is mm-hmm. this is this a church that's content? And so I think when I hear happy, that's what I mean. That's what I think of is like, is this church at peace with mm-hmm. how God's using them as a body? Are they at peace with mm-hmm. what their role is in the community? Yeah, the reason I brought this one up and thought this was an important question is because you can have one, two, and three and be harsh. Mm-hmm. You can have a, the culture is harsh. Mm. The culture is we're right and everybody else is wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you can have those three, but if you just stop at that and don't see what is the effect of qualified leaders, biblical gospel and biblical preaching, if the effect of that is not a group of people that are happy, humble and loving towards one another, mm-hmm. then there's something wrong. Yeah. And that's the idea, is that you can get those other three right and still not right. be a good church. Yeah. yeah. And there are really two extremes. You know, you can be a church that, that claims to uphold the truth and, and kind of fall into a ditch, like what you're mm-hmm. talking about, where there, there really is no genuine and sincere love, and, and the culture will bear witness to that. Uh, but on the other hand, you can uphold this idea of love. We're going to mm-hmm. love each other, and yet it doesn't flow from the truth. Mm-hmm. And so scripture again and again is truth in love, yeah. right? Grace and mm-hmm. truth. And mm-hmm. so uh, you have to have both of those, and mm-hmm. you can't hide hypocrisy. The culture mm-hmm. will always reveal that. Mm, that's right. So the fifth question that helps people spot a good church is, are the leaders accessible? And the idea here is that the leaders are shepherds. They they know the flock. They are they, they smell like the sheep. They're around the sheep. They counsel 
the sheep, they care for the sheep, they're not entrepreneurs, they're not tucked away in, in an ivory tower, they're not mm-hmm. tucked away away from the people, people are the problems, but just the opposite of that, that they see themselves as we exist here for the benefit of the flock. Can you guys speak to that? Yeah, if we're talking about Again, a biblical command to leaders, First Peter 5, shepherd the flock of God among you, uh, requires active participation and active oversight. Uh, and so, you know, we're called to not do that out of compulsion, not something that's like, ah, oh, such a drag to have to deal with all of these. Ministry would be great without all the people, right? Mm-hmm. That can be the mentality. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I, I think we've all experienced being at those churches where the pastors are are never available. They, they're they kind of green room to stage to office guys and, and trying to get a meeting with them is near impossible. Uh, you know, and and to commend our team, you know, I I think it's our attitude in all of our hearts to be available as much as we can to shepherd, um, not to just you know fly the redeemer flag, but that's our heart, and I think that should be the natural heart of any shepherd-minded leader is how can I be available to help our people as they need, not as I'm available. Yeah, church size plays a part of this too, though. As the church gets bigger Mm -hmm. and um, accessibility um, becomes a little more challenging, Mm solid shepherds will set up um, systems of accessibility where they're, they're going to make sure there's people, deacons in place, they're going to make sure there's mm-hmm. people in place that people can go to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, then obviously if something rises to a level where where like the lead pastor needs to get involved, of course that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But as, as churches grow, you want to mm-hmm. be looking for this. Is is there patterns or, or systems in place where your needs can be met and dealt with yeah that's a good point yeah when you look out on the weekend um do you see the pastors right can you talk to them can you pray with them Mm -hmm. you know just some things as simple as that or are you able to do that um regardless of how large Mm -hmm. the church gets is there Mm -hmm. just a sense like these guys love the people in this church i don't Mm -hmm. think a church will ever be a loving church unless that is modeled by the pastors Mm -hmm. in that church it's impossible to be a pastor and not love your sheep Uh, i I mean it's it's in that first peter five you know shepherd Mm -hmm. the flock of god and in that is that you love that flock i mean i I couldn't imagine being in a church where i don't love the people and caring for the Mm -hmm. people and that's demonstrative demonstrative in a variety of ways in that you know yeah. so and i love what what dale brought to to the conversation because as churches do grow you know people will lose uh, the sense that they're 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 they'll get a sense they're losing touch with the leadership mm-hmm. and uh though that's not intentional it can happen and so that intentionality from the leadership to say okay uh we're not we, we cannot you know say 10 to 20 pastors cannot effectively shepherd two to 5,000 people. And so we need to be equipping the body, equipping uh, servant leaders to help us alongside of us to uh, reach those shepherding moments and instill confidence of mm-hmm. the individual into the body of Christ, not specifically just one individual man. So yeah. I think there's a, a re- that's another thing to look for is as the church does grow, are they growing in a healthy manner and with a shepherding mindset? Yeah, the, the, and I love the that. model of the book of Acts, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's, it's one of the things to look for in a church. Do they have systems in place where needs can be met? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So sixth question is, is the church accessible? And the idea there is, is there an exclusive, we don't allow people to get in, we make it really hard for them Mm -hmm. to feel like a part of the life of the church, or is it easy for people to get connected and belong as part of a church? Are there ways to serve? Are there ways to get connected to other people? Um, Have you guys been in a church or or seen churches, know about churches where it was just people couldn't get in, it was too hard? Yeah, I you know I remember a church in our town. They had like a twenty five page membership handbook that mm-hmm. um, I, I wondered if you know Paul himself could become a member <laughs> there because there was so much minutia of detail. And I, I yeah. like the heartbeat where we say if you're a member of heaven, you can be a member of the church because mm-hmm. in a sense you already are. When you become right. a Christian, you're a member of Christ's church, and this is the local expression of that. And so we don't need to make it harder than Scripture, and a lot of churches do. And I think there's mm-hmm. a good motive in the most part of trying to make sure that that true Christians are being connected to the membership and not just welcome anybody. I've seen it the other way too, mm-hmm. where it's like, great, you're breathing, you're a member. Mm-hmm. Um, and so somewhere in there, you do have to vet and, and find out 
where they're really at, but to make it harder than Jesus makes it isn't helpful. Yeah, I love the imagery of the body, the body mm-hmm. of Christ. And what that means is that there is there is implied connectedness, right? So the mm-hmm. my little finger's connected to my hand, my hand's connected to my wrist, my wrist goes to my elbow, and mm-hmm. so on and so on. My if my if my pinky was amputated and laying on the table, it wouldn't be very helpful. It's not healthy. It's not yeah. healthy, right? It's, not, so, it's no longer a part of your body. So <laughs> as shepherds, one mm-hmm. of our roles, and, and we've, you know, in the last few years, we've really have dove into this here at Redeemer. One of our roles is making sure we have things in place where people can connect. Multiple opportunities, multiple doors, side doors, front doors, where people can come in and connect with the body here at Redeemer. Yeah, there's a there's a bit of an initiative that has to take place. Mm-hmm. People have to take mm-hmm. a first step or a next step in order to do that. But but there are ways, there should be ways for people to get connected to other believers in a good church. Well, the, I'm, gl- I'm glad you said that because I remember making the transition from a, a medium-sized church to a very large church when we moved to Los Angeles. And uh, it was great, it was Grace Community Church, really, really solid, wonderful church. Uh, but going there, it was intimidating. And it seemed as though it was a big system that was very hard to break into. In reality, it wasn't, but mm-hmm. it took initiative. You know, So mm-hmm. we have to remember that e- even we can have that perception that it's not very welcoming. The question is, is that really true? Or, or am I just a fearing man? Am I fearing breaking in and maybe you know, not getting the acceptance that I thought I would. But when I did finally go and join a group and, and start to make friends, there, there was an, a, you know, an extreme openness and welcomeness in that group. And so I just don't want people to get the impression that it's all on the church. I love that you mm-hmm. said that because mm-hmm. we do need to take, if you take that initiative and go and reach out and try to connect and there's no mechanism or it's designed to be so difficult, that's a good warning sign. Yeah, there should be thoughtfulness on both sides. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right, sure. There's a connection here too with the past couple of questions we've asked uh, because starting with leadership, if the leaders before anything about giftedness is in the equation, it begins by recognizing that we're all members of the body, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Starts there. Mm -hmm. And then if we're establishing a culture where other people experience that, well, then there's gonna be a hospitableness about the rest of the the church community Mm -hmm. as well. For sure. Mm -hmm. Seventh question that people should ask to spot a good church, I think would be, are the leaders building, is the church, building the kingdom or their own castle Mm. and the question this gives some some discernment as to the question is this a pastor-centered church is this a church-centered church or is this a christ-centered church Mm. and so can you guys flesh that out a little bit for people yeah i'm thinking of ways that you would be able to, to discern between mm-hmm. between those three i think we've already touched on some of them yeah. right um as far as who's being honored mm-hmm. inside inside the services who's being honored inside the culture of the church um you can you can discern um between between those three options there by just watching that mm-hmm. right so if 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 you're looking for a christ centered church which by the way hint you should be mm-hmm. um if you're mm-hmm. looking for a christ centered church through the sermons christ is going to be honored through the service of people christ is going to be honored in the gathering of worship and the things that are happening um, corporately christ is going to be honored and you're going to have people who attend that church um, in their daily lives where christ is going to be honored so you can discern by that by answering that question alone Mm -hmm. who's being honored and who's not Mm. yeah every kingdom has a king that's right so who who is the church pointing to as king Um, and if it's if it's Christ as he is the the king of the kingdom, then you'll know you're in a biblical church. Yeah, Yeah, one of the ways you can see this too is that there there are churches, again, that that could check a lot of these boxes, Mm -hmm. but when they think about other churches, it's it's all about their church mm. like we don't we mm-hmm. we're suspicious mm-hmm. of all other churches we don't play nice with any other churches mm-hmm. there's not a sense of that we're all in this together we're we're part of the big c church with other churches here in the in the area no we're the only true church we're the only faithful church we got to be suspicious of everybody else that you can see the, the 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 kingdom the castle building in that versus the 
kingdom build. And I think another way that, that you see this is you guys were saying this, but there is an elevation of a man or a mm-hmm. of a man and, and his wife, and they are the focal point of the church. That mm-hmm. everything revolves around those two, and mm-hmm. that's a that's a huge red flag again mm-hmm. because Christ is to be the center of our church, mm-hmm. not not any human being at all. We you you often say you, you never put pastors on a pedestal because mm-hmm. they they can't live up to that pedestal. Only yeah. Jesus lives up to that pedestal, right. right? And so having a church that 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 or finding a church that removes those pedestals and puts Christ there mm-hmm. and keeps him there is mm-hmm. a critical critical thing yeah. to finding a good church. Yeah. One of the reasons I think I like that you. Uh, magnify the character of John the Baptist so much is because his role should be the pastor's role for you know right. like you say in the Amen. artwork John that's the right. Baptist is always just the one point he's like no Jesus is over there that's right and mm-hmm. so if the the pastoral team in particular if the lead teaching pastor is not the one going like this yeah. but somehow he's going like look at my book or look at my right, exactly. ministry my resources my yeah. what we're building here then that's a huge indicator but if the pastor is always pointing to yeah. Jesus that's a healthy mm-hmm. indicator yeah a quick question is who's being served mm-hmm. who's being served is yeah. the pastor being served is the church being served Mm -hmm. and what i mean by that being the church being promoted being advanced or is it jesus being served Mm -hmm. and his people yeah another way to put it are the do the people exist for the benefit of the pastors Mm -hmm. or does the pastor do the pastors exist for the benefit of the people that's something you should be able to try to sniff out and even pray about when looking for a good church Mm -hmm. eighth and final question how to spot a good church is are they caving to the culture Mm -hmm. part of what it means to be a shepherd We've talked about it. We'll summarize it. They feed the flock God's word. Mm -hmm. They lead the flock according to God's word. They care for the people that God has entrusted to their care. And then fourth, they protect the flock. There are a ton of attacks against the church from the culture. And a good church is going to understand that when it comes to the larger culture, we are the church militant. We are the church. counter to the culture that's out there. But what are some of the things that should be a red flag for people for a church that's that's caving to the culture? When the culture is driving the conversation, mm-hmm. you know, we understand from Second Peter 1, other places, that the Bible is our absolute authority and is absolutely sufficient for all things according to life and doctrine. And so, you know, when We read in places like Titus 3, you know, to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. When the culture is pushing these discussions into the church and saying, no, you must, right? We we are not bound by the law to, uh, you know, to uh, submit ourselves to any such things. Uh, And when a pastor, a leader, a shepherd does not have the wits about him to keep the church on track of focusing on scripture and on Christ, uh, then that's a huge red flag that Mm -hmm. that church might not be a healthy functioning body, right? Yeah, so if you you come across a church with a Black Lives Matter flag, mm-hmm. a rainbow flag, you're, what's that, what that screaming is that the culture is dictating the direction of our church, mm-hmm. not the scriptures. And we're going to interpret the scriptures in light of culture rather than interpret the culture in light of scripture. What are some other things out there that are going, okay, they're, they're starting to cave to the culture. Anything else you guys see out there? Well, there are only two options. Either the church is being discipled by the culture mm-hmm. or the church is fulfilling the great commission and is making disciples mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so you know paul speaks in romans 12 to do not be conformed to the patterns of this world yeah. uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and as mm-hmm. we talked about that happens through the word so the word of god sets the agenda um so if we're, yeah. we're being uh, discipled by the culture we'll see evidence of that but if we're fulfilling the great commission then there will be evidence of that as well yeah. and, and kind of to go along with Romans 12 too, there, the, the purpose of that do not be conformed, but be transformed so that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I think mm-hmm. if we understand what is actually happening, the, the church versus the world, the church's mission is always going to be Christ and the Great Commission, and the world's mission is always going to be mm-hmm. destroy the church. Mm-hmm. And so we can't somehow 
conflate the two or dovetail the two together to make our ministries better, we're, mm-hmm. we're always going to be bringing poison in from outside mm-hmm. if we're not careful. Yeah. It's the false instinct that in order to reach and win the world, we have to kind of be like them. Yeah. rather than what we are offering is a counter to what the world offers. That's and right. so it sounds counterintuitive to do that, but that's how churches grow. The others might for a while because they're, they're, they're trying to make the sermons like movies or that type of thing, trying to woo in uh, the outside world when they can go to the theater and see something better than we could do on a Sunday mm-hmm. morning mm-hmm. any day of the week. We don't have a $200 million budget um, to do that. What we offer is truth and reality, yeah. and that and that is the most countercultural thing. Our authority then is not what can we change to, to bring them in, mm-hmm. but rather here's the truth, and this is why this is different. Yeah. Uh, following Christ is completely different. It's truth over that. trend, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of a lot of churches will ch- uh, chase some of the trends going on in culture and speak to them, and even um, give into them. Give into yeah. them. Um, yeah. And a, a church that you should be looking for is a church that, no matter what the trends are in culture, they're doubling down on truth every single Sunday, every right. single Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday mm-hmm. as well. It's it's a church that is knows what the mission is. Right, mm-hmm. and that's that's the church you should be looking for, mm-hmm. not a church who's flying the latest flag mm-hmm. or posting the latest meme about what's going on in Washington or anybody, anywhere else. It's the church that's going to stand on the truth, mm-hmm. not the trend. And it's not tr- a church, sorry, Todd, it's not a church that ignores those things or is ignorant of the culture. Mm-hmm. We can engage the culture with a biblical worldview mm-hmm. But we're not allowing the culture to dictate. Yeah, that's to implied us. when I'm talking Absolutely. about the truth. The truth speaks yeah. into trends, yeah, right? We don't want trends speaking into truth, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. that's that's a, an important distinction. So mm-hmm. I agree with you. Yeah, I'm restating exactly what we've been saying. But yeah. it's who we're trying to please. Are we trying to please the outside world, who doesn't even like Christ, or are we trying to please Christ with the way He wants us to reach the world? And uh, that. That just seems to mm-hmm. to counter what's instinctive. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. a lot of times. Yeah, is there a sense that the leadership is ashamed of some parts of the Bible, yeah. mm. right. or are they not willing to say these groups of people that call themselves Christians are not really Christians? Mm. You know, Roman Catholics, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on. Um, are they willing? Are they willing to say that, mm-hmm. or are they mm-hmm. afraid to say that? Or are they saying, "No, you know, we're all we're all God's family"? Are they imbibing mm-hmm. anti-gospel ideology? The biggest one today is is social justice movement, cultural mm-hmm. Marxism mm-hmm. disguised as social justice, mm-hmm. seeking to integrate itself. Are they are they giving into that? So you're hearing diversity, equity, inclusion, hearing that kind of language. Um, another huge one in our culture right now is female pastors, mm-hmm. churches that would would raise against that just a few years ago or now now have female pastors right. they're mm-hmm. capitulating to the culture and mm-hmm. so I, I don't know at, at the end of the day when when people are looking for a good church we've, we've had an extended discussion because there are a lot of significant questions mm-hmm. that people need to ask so to wrap our time up what are some practical things that people should do when looking for a church we've talked about the principles and we've talked about the preferences mm-hmm. but now with the, with the practical uh, things people can do I'll, I'll throw one of them out there mm-hmm. uh, make sure that you read the website of the church yeah. you're looking at make mm. sure you know it really well uh, make sure that you're you're seeing okay are they seeking to be biblical is there a sense like i, I can agree with what's what's being mm-hmm. said here are they are they even going beyond just the the normal vanilla um yeah we believe in jesus and salvation by mm-hmm. grace alone or grace and faith but are they are they willing in their doctoral statement to say like well this is where we stand on various things mm-hmm. anything else any other practical advice you give people yeah when you look on those websites you can sometimes guess to who they're connected to. I think that can be a good, yeah. you know, what seminaries the pastors go to, what if there's some sort of fellowships, yep. denominations, yep. you know, it's, it's there in the doctrinal statement as well if you're paying attention. But just keeping an eye on those types of things, then that can answer a lot of questions too. Yeah, I would, I would yeah. include a network. Like we're right. we're a part of a network that um, that you know uh, only allows really solid churches to be a part of that. So check out what networks mm-hmm. um, the, the mm-hmm. church affiliate with, which mm-hmm. would be like a de- denomination as well. Mm-hmm. But I also would add, um, get on their social media sites. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look at what's happening on their social media. What are people talking about? What are they promoting? What are they worshiping? That's great. Um, you can get a lot of insight about a church from 
from the people who are engaged on social media in mm -hmm. that church. What about reviews? Would Yelp and Google and all that stuff? Is that helpful or? They're, some, can they be. can be funny yeah, sometimes, be. Yeah. but uh, yeah. yeah, we've yeah. we've got a couple of one star reviews here at Redeemer that I think if you read it, you're like, oh, I'm going to go to that church. So five star to one star, they all could be helpful. Yeah. I think reaching out to some of the leadership too nowadays with email and social media and that type of thing to yeah. you read the doctrinal statement there can be a, a decent doctrinal statement but then how is it really what's it really like is that yeah. thing being fleshed yeah. out and so to to have a personal conversation with an elder or even a member or somebody to kind of get to what's really happening there what's really going on yeah. i think is key just to give a, a practical example uh, and i think a good one of a um a couple that has recently started attending Redeemer, their their first step was understanding what does the Bible say about a healthy church. Uh, they then went to what is basically our front door, which is our website, to mm -hmm. kind of, as best they can, g get a grip on who we are as a church, yeah. you know, what do we teach, what mm -hmm. do we stand for, what are our ministries like, um, what, what schools did the leadership attend. Um, next, they, they sent in an email, I believe, talked to uh, one of the pastors, uh, and then they scheduled a time not scheduled just visited the church mm -hmm. uh and following up from that they're like we love redeemer we're so mm -hmm. glad we're here um so i just think those are the steps that yeah. you know you, you need to just be thoughtful about um what church you're going to attend because it should be a central part of mm -hmm. of your life and your family's life mm -hmm. yeah you should be able to answer these questions for the churches that you're going to maybe even ask the leaders and maybe even ask other people that go to the church um, these questions that we've given, um, you can pray all throughout. God, what's what's your will for my life? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you if you live in a place where you find a church and you can't answer all eight affirmatively, then you find the one that's closest. Mm -hmm. You find the one that's the best, and mm -hmm. you pour your life into that place. Mm -hmm. um, I'd even recommend going more than once. Like mm -hmm. go to at least twice. Mm -hmm. Every church has a bad weekend. It just mm -hmm. happens sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. And so you may not get an accurate view of the church that weekend. Yeah. Go one more time. Give them a second chance. If I um, could add one yeah. more thing to that too, yeah. don't go in with a judgmental spirit go and asking the Lord, is this where you yeah, want me to commit absolutely. as a family? And using this as a framework, use it as a wisdom framework, mm -hmm. not as a judgmental framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on our website too, we have a church finder tab mm -hmm. that you can go to where there are uh, resources, search engines that help you find good churches on those sites. And so we'd recommend that too. Yeah, so. I would say along those lines too, even taking a step further, this is so important. Sometimes it people is. forget to kind of orchestrate their life around church life. Mm. And so they'll go, we're going to move to Jersey yeah. because we want to go to Jersey. But you haven't scoped out if there's a church in Jersey that you should go to. Yeah. Yes. And so they'll end up in Jersey and then die in a wasteland, a spiritual wasteland. I'm just picking on Jersey. Sure. I don't really yeah, know. I don't think anybody I mean, ever said churches. <laughs> there's great <laughs> churches in Jersey, I'm sure. But it, it becomes like the 10th <laughs> priority on the list rather than, yeah. you know, I, we do need to move or we're going this place. Where is the church that we want to go to in that area, mm. first and foremost, that we can yes. dive into right away, not just, well, we'll figure what, that out when we get there. Yeah, yeah to that point, so. we've had people move to, to Phoenix just to come to Redeemer yeah. for that very reason, because yeah. they've experienced that mm -hmm. and realized how much either damage it was doing or there was mm -hmm. the potential to do to their family. Mm -hmm. They said, we want to commit first and foremost to a church we know we can trust. I know jobs don't always allow some flexibility. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're moving to Chicago, so you got to make the best with mm -hmm. what you got. Yeah. And it may not meet all your preferences, but again, this is looking past the preferences to what is essential to yeah. look for but, in a good church. But that's a good point though, to mm -hmm. not, if you if you have the freedom to move, to not just say, this is where we're gonna move because we wanna, like we're gonna mm -hmm. move to Martha's Vineyard because we wanna move to Martha's Vineyard. And it's mm -hmm. like, is there a church on the island? No. Mm -hmm probably wise to ask okay. if that's God's will for your mm -hmm. life rather mm -hmm. than that's just what we want to do. Sure. So that was a great point, yeah. yeah. So I'll make it even stronger and say, the most important decision that you make for your family mm -hmm. is the local church that you are belonging 100%. to. 100%. Mm -hmm. yep. More than the neighborhood, <laughs> more than the schools, more than the job, mm. it is your local church. It will have a generational effect on your life. 
if and the, the lives of your kids, your grandkids even, yeah. if you make a good or may you make a bad decision on this. Mm. That's why we did this video. And, and there are a lot of good churches out there. There, mm -hmm. are, there are faithful people, faithful men leading churches, faithful people serving in churches, faithful people serving community and doing yeah. evangelism out there. Finding a good church is not as hard as some people make it. And because I think they're, they're focusing on preferences right. yeah. and not what we're talking about ah. here today. Mm -hmm. Start with what we're talking about here today. Preferences are a dangerous thing because preferences lead to what? They lead to self. Mm -hmm. So you wanna be very careful with preferences. We all have them, we all have them, but be very careful making decisions based on preferences. Mm -hmm. Make your decision about a local church about what we talked about today. Yep. Yeah. Hope that was helpful. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Redeeming Truth. Hey, don't leave yet. If you're part of the 75% of people that watch our content but haven't subscribed, this is your time. Go down and find that little subscribe button and click it. That way you will know every time we come out with more content here from Redeemer Bible Church. Also, if you would like to give to this ministry, this is the only way that this ministry can happen. Make sure to click the link down below to the give button and you can give to the ministry here at Redeemer. And then finally, if you wanna know more about what's going on, check out this podcast right here.